how to make katsu kore. And the first step is to get your curry sauce mix like we just showed you. And then we want to peel an onion and cut it in half. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start cutting onion wedges and that's going to be one of the ingredients in our curry. And keep in mind that all proportions here for vegetables are, are really at your discretion. So once we cut the onion wedges, we use baby carrots. If you want to, you can use regular carrots. Uh, you'd have to peel one medium sized one and cut it up good. We like baby carrots just because, you know, the size and, and the way they taste. They taste a little bit sweeter to us, so we're a big fan of them. But we have eight here. Like I said, you know, what you put in your own curry is up to you. It really is whatever you like. This is just the way we happen to do it, and we think it tastes really good. So once we have the baby carrots cut up, we also have a peeled potato, and we're going to go ahead and you'll notice we cut most of the little dark spots out of it as well. The key here is just to get all the potato pieces the same size so that way when you uh, boil them they all finish around you know at the same time. So here we go you'll notice we're cutting them up. I think we're gonna end up cutting up up in fourths today and there we go just like so. And peeling a potato I'm sure is nothing foreign to anyone in the audience but uh, definitely getting them in Wedges that are easy to cook at the same time certainly is important. There we go. Looks like the housewife's happy with that. So the next step is to get beef. And our beef here that we have is very, very slim, thinly sliced, almost like deli sliced meat, but it's raw. And this is really difficult to find outside of the Asian stores. If you have a hard time getting meat like this, feel free to use cubed. You know, just get the cubed sirloin steak or whatever you want to use to go ahead and use in your curry. We've taken this thinly sliced beef and wrapped it up in kind of a roll and are slicing through it to get a lot of really thin, uh, long stringy beef slices in our curry. It's just the, the way they usually do it and once you get used to it, it's really hard to go to anything else. But that being said, the cubes will work just fine if that's the best you can do. And it's kind of funny cutting the meat when it's this thin like this. It, for some reason, it's a lot harder than it looks. And the next step, what we've done here is we have some oil in the bottom of the pan and we're just starting to brown the meat. We're not gonna brown it all the way though. We really wanna show you this part because it's key that you don't cook the meat all up front and then go and just kind of overcook it for the next half hour. So with the oil here, what we've done is we've turned our stove on high and we're waiting for the stove to, or for the pot to heat up slowly with the stove. And we have a little bit of oil in there and we're just going to keep mixing the meat around on the bottom of the pot like so. Just keep mixing it. And that really is one of the, uh, you know, characteristics of a lot of Asian cooking. For a long time, they had very, very powerful but short-lived heat sources. That's why they have cooking utensils like the wok and things like that. You know, baking wasn't something they traditionally did because that required a lot of heat for a long time. But here, as you can see, we're really just trying to work with the hot uh, heat and make sure that we're not burning the meat and we don't want to brown it completely. We're going to show you exactly where you want it to be when you go ahead and start adding the rest of your vegetables. So back and forth, back and forth, uh, you know, right here at the beginning, there you go, just trying to show everyone where we're at here and we're not quite there. We're going to keep mixing it up and uh, this part is a little tedious but we do want to show you because it's really important to get the meat just right. And you'll notice here, just like I said, mixing and mixing and mixing. Your forearm's certainly going to get to work out at this portion of the, of the cooking. So there we go. That's where we're at. I'm going to keep mixing it around. Almost there. Almost there. Just keep mixing and mixing. And you'll notice here that we're using a wooden spoon. Usually we don't at home. Honestly, we prefer the cooking chopsticks. They're a lot more precise. And once you get used to them, you're really happy with them. But there we go. I believe that's what we're looking for. So once the meat gets to that stage, we want to go ahead and pull out all the vegetables we just cut up and go ahead and put them right on top of the meat like so. And once we've done that, we're going to go ahead and start mixing and using a scooping motion. First thing we're doing is breaking up our... There we go. There's the scooping motion. We're breaking up the onions. But we want to keep scooping and mixing that way to get the meat off the bottom. Just because we put vegetables on top of them doesn't mean the meat can't burn. 
So we're gonna keep mixing and scooping and don't worry if stuff flies out of your pot like you just saw. Happens to us all the time. You may have noticed our pug pacing in the background. He loves the scraps that fly off the stove. So there we go. We're just mixing and scooping like so, using that scooping motion because getting the meat off the bottom is a little bit of a challenge. And you'll notice the housewife used her secret hand trick to get some of the ingredients back in the pot. That's, that's the way it is. So we just keep scooping. There's our pug making a brief appearance, looking for scraps. And this part in the beginning, uh, I know we're showing you a lot of footage here. Usually we do like to fast forward, but this really is the important part to make sure that you're just mixing as fast as you can, keeping the meat from burning and getting everything set for when you add your water. Because after you add your water and then the curry bricks, really you're, you're almost home free. I say almost, not really, but you don't need to worry about stuff burning as much. So here we go, just mixing and mixing and mixing. And that scooping motion you'll see keeps coming back because that really, really is important. And uh, you'll see stuff just really wants to jump out of your pot. And you'll notice now that the meat is pretty, turning to a pretty evenly brown color. And that's, you know, that's why we put the vegetables in while the meat was still a little bit pink. And you'll notice too, the coil on our stove is turning a little bit of a red color. Uh, that means, of course, it's getting hotter and hotter and our pug is getting hungry and hungrier, and that's what we want it to look like right there. Now is when we're gonna start adding our water. Uh, today we made, we're using three cups, and the trick here is that you wanna go ahead and plot a potato, and we wanna get it to the point where we can have a chopstick slide right into it very easily. And obviously it's raw now, so that can happen, but when you do get to that point, that's how you know your veggies are done. So there you go, put it in a chopstick, notice how it goes right into the potato. That's what we're looking for. Now, once we get to that point, that's when the fun stuff happens. That's when we pull out our curry sauce brick mix and we wanna go ahead and break it into fours. It's actually um, scored at the bottom, so it breaks very easily. And we go ahead, you don't wanna drop these in, you wanna put them in gently. If you drop them in, you're gonna splatter hot water and no one's happy when that happens. So we made enough today to go ahead and use four of those little bricklets or a whole box of curry. And next step is to go ahead and just start mixing again. We're kind of starting that all over. And, uh, but these curry bricks, when the water is nice and boiling hot, they melt pretty easily. The trick is here that you really want to stir because sometimes the, well, you get about half of them to melt and then you don't realize that there's one that just hasn't melted at all. So really keep stirring and stirring and stirring and be sure you get all of them to dissolve. They get trickier to find as the sauce gets thicker and thicker because they do melt. And as they melt, it turns from a boiling pot of veggies and meat with water in it to more of the curry, it's thicker. And uh, you really just gotta keep stirring. And there you can notice especially the texture of the meat, how we use that thinly sliced beef, it really pops out at you. And uh, that, that really is one of the neat things. So there we go, we've mixed it in, we've let it boil for just a couple minutes, and now we're gonna go ahead and add some milk. Now we add the milk to give it that extra richness and really seal off the flavor. And right about now, well, let me take that back. You'll really get a decent curry smell once you mix in the bricks at first, but once you mix in the milk and then go ahead and mix it up, that's when you really, you can tell that, that your curry is, is, is what you're coming to expect. The smell is amazing and it smells absolutely fabulous in the kitchen. And once we've done that, the next trick to see if your curry is done or not is pull out a spoon and give it a taste. We're gonna do that off camera and uh, make sure your curry's where you want it, and we believe it is, and that's what it looks like. That's the curry you're looking for. Now today we are making katsu curry, so part of it is curry and part of it is the katsu. Now we have a pork cutlet, and we're gonna slice the beef around the edge like so on that fatty outer edge. 
And that's because when we cook it, as you guys know, the, cook, the meat shrinks and the fat stays the same. That way it'll allow the fat to uh, flex. So we flip it over and we score the fat ring around as well. Same fashion, just like so. Lots of those is the way to do it. And then we want to go ahead and score the meat. That way it really lets the flavor in and uh, really helps when you cook it as well. Let's it move as well, it makes the meat more flexible. Now we're gonna add salt. And we use the fancy sea salt today. You can use regular if you like. And we got the fancy black pepper. And we're gonna go ahead and season both sides of the meat. And just pat it in just a touch to make sure it sticks to the meat. Now we're gonna go ahead and rub the meat in flour and really coat that really good. And notice that we're not just doing the two broad sides, we're gonna do it on the edges as well. That's really important because the flour helps us go ahead and keep the salt and pepper inside, but also to go ahead and get that egg to stick to the meat as well. So there you go, the same manner, we're gonna coat the entire pork cutlet, the edges as well, with the egg to get us ready for the last step, which is to go ahead and put the breadcrumbs all over it. And definitely you wanna be generous with the breadcrumbs. These are really, really good. And they add that extra little bit of kick. So we're going ahead and using as much of the breadcrumbs as we can, not just on the broad sides, but on the edges as well. And make sure we really, really get that thing coated nice and evenly all the way around. And I think we're almost there. There you go. That's what you want it to look like. And there it is on a plate before we cook it as well. Uh, you can see the salt and pepper, the breadcrumbs. Now to know if your oil, this is vegetable oil, is hot enough, you take one of your breadcrumbs and you drop it in your hot oil. And if you notice that it's bubbling right up and rises right to the top, that means your oil is hot enough to cook in. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take out these cutlets. We're making two of them and go ahead and put them in gently. Definitely do not let these splatter in there. Hot oil burns a lot. So there you go. You'll notice one of them, we put more salt and pepper on the outside. That's just personal taste preference, it's up to you. So we let these cook for a couple minutes and you definitely wanna check the bottom. You don't wanna let these burn. And uh, once they get to a good golden brown, you wanna go ahead and flip them over. And uh, I must say the housewife has it down to quite an art. It really is hard to tell exactly how many minutes it's going to take. It really depends on your oil temperature. But uh, she really has it down where she can just flip them over uh, once and they're done. So uh, if you need to flip them over a couple times, that's all right. But like I said, our, our housewife is pretty sharp. So that's the color we're looking for. And really, we want to make sure we get our meat cooked all the way through and uh, you know to make it safe to eat. So we fast forward a couple minutes and uh, we're checking the bottom to make sure it's the right color that we're after or not. And it looks like we have just a little bit more to go here. And you'll notice that in our video on occasion, by the handle, our superstar pug likes to show up and sniff around for scraps. He knows that, that cooking is an art and you know, sometimes art gets messy and whenever scraps are on the floor, he is there to uh, do the dirty work for us and clean it up. So you notice here, they're, these things are boiling in the oil. Uh, they're getting close to done. And the color really is, is what we're looking for, the golden brown. And it looks like we fast forward a couple more minutes and, and this has got to be close. So we're gonna go ahead and have a look here. Oh, looks like this one passes the test. Maybe I spoke too soon, but once we're there, our housewife's definitely gonna pull them out. There we go, this one's ready to go. So, I'm gonna give you folks out there a look at it, and that's the color we're looking for, that's what we want it to look like. And we're gonna go ahead and pull them out of the oil, and. The next key for our katsukure is to go ahead and cut this, not, they're not bite sized slices, they're a little bit more than that, I call them two bite slices. But go ahead and slice this up like so, and then we want to put the sliced pork cutlet on top of our bed of rice, and then we take the curry that we just finished and we want to put it over the cutlet 
and let it fall away from the rice. Traditionally, when you serve curry rice, you want the curry and rice to be separate. Uh, you don't want to mix them. It's up to the eater's choice how they want to do it. And there you go. That's katsu curry, and this stuff is delicious. This really is a great way to serve curry. So thank you for watching. We appreciate likes and comments. Please remember to subscribe.